Okay, well, let's get uh, rolling, maybe. Um, so, t we've been talking about fluid dynamics, finally, uh, after talking about fluid statics. Um, we've noted that, really, a fluid isn't anything different from uh, anything you'd have seen in your physics classes, such as the behavior of solids. Um, the primary parameter that controls what goes for us uh, I want to stop this, is, uh, is uh, Newton's second law, F equals ma. Um, I don't want to do that. I want to go back. And so, well, let's, uh, let's go back to this. So as we've been seeing here, the, the characteristics of, it doesn't look like uh, what I was looking for, yeah. The characteristics of what we are dealing with is that fluids can have motion and we can use them in a useful way to do useful things for us. And so in this particular case, this isn't actually all that different from the example we talked about of a, of a jet engine pushing over a car. You have fluid coming out of the pack of something. Here it's, uh, I don't know if it's uh, just being released under pressure or if it's a combustion source. I presume it's a combustion source. It zooms out at some high rate at relatively low pressure from the uh, piece of equipment. And then it impacts the ground. And as a result of doing that, it uh, destroys the momentum of that fluid. And it provides a force. So it provides a, a pressure where it impacts the ground. And so we talked about that last time in terms of Bernoulli's expression. Uh, we developed Bernoulli from our equation for fluid statics, where we have uh, the changes in pressure were related to accelerations of the liquid due to gravity and due to some other acceleration or deceleration um, and developed Bernoulli's equation in a couple of different ways and um, as a, this, yeah, I want to just stop it so it doesn't play in the background and so today we will do a take, a, a take on that I guess in some respects in that and this figure epitomizes it. So instead of looking only at the behavior in a linear sense, we talked about Bernoulli's equation being um, along a streamline. We said that there was also another way that we could look at how fluid pressures or velocities change within a flowing fluid, and that is to go perpendicular to a streamline. And so in the same way that when we talked about fluid statics, we talked about accelerating fluids in a linear acceleration, and we talked about rotating fluids uh, in terms of rotating in, a, in a, a, a barrel where you'd get this parabolic surface. Then when we're talking about uh, Bernoulli's equation, we can write Bernoulli's equation in the way that you're probably used to seeing it, which is between an upstream and downstream location along a streamline, which is the pathway that molecules would take. And we can also do it perpendicular to that streamline where we have to draw on our resources of centripetal force. And that's really the relevance of this. So if you could imagine squirting fluid around this track, the same forces that fluid would feel would be the same forces that you'd feel if you're sitting in the, uh, the driver's seat of this car doing this kind of rather random uh, activity going around uh, um, the, the big wheel. And so you could imagine as you're being forced around this track that in the same way as being static in an elevator, going up you'd feel the acceleration in your ankles. As you go around this track, you'd expect to feel yourself being pushed into the seat as you went around it. And that's centripetal force. And so in the same way that a car, <coughs> sitting in a car and being accelerated uh, around the track, you'd feel that. If you're a fluid, the fluid would feel exactly the same forces. And so that's uh, what we'll talk about uh, today. So this is the entree into dealing with that. And so we need to revisit centripetal force again, which will be able to, to give us the expressions we want. All right? So I'm kill that off. I noticed last time that the um, the stuff was playing in the background and it was overprinting my voice, which might be nice, but uh, but perhaps isn't very useful if you're it was it, yeah it was in the background. And so so that's what we'll attempt to, to deal with today. So understanding something about uh, fluid fluid dynamics. So as is our custom, uh, we'll kind of recap maybe quickly what we've uh, talked about so far. Uh, you remember last time. We talked about this. We talked about Bernoulli's equation. This is Bernoulli. 
They're both Bernoulli, Daniel Bernoulli, I think he's Swiss. And the form that we ended up with, the, the normal form is this form, and it's derivative, which we derived it from. This is just the fluid pressure with location. We call it DPDZ, but it's location along the streamline. S is the distance along the streamline. This is elevation, and so, if you like, S is the streamline. N is normal to the streamline, which we haven't talked about yet. This is perpendicular. This could be our aerofoil, I guess. That was the example we used last time. And uh, the other thing I guess we should remember is that in our sign convention, always, Z is positive upwards. Just, just our convention. And so that's important when we deal with uh, this term here. So we can write it in a differential way which is less useful to us. We can integrate this and get it in the usual way we deal with it. And the more normal way for us to look at this, uh, for me anyway, is pressure head plus velocity head plus elevation head. And so we talked last time that you can write it upstream. You can write it downstream at two locations. You hope that you have, out of the six terms, you have five of them, and then you solve for the sixth. That's, that's it. So, so that's along a streamline. So what we'll talk about today is, is uh, normal to the streamline. So in other words, we know how pressures would change if we went from location one to location two, because we kind of dealt with that last time. So we'd write Bernoulli's equation at location one and we'd equate it to the same expression written at location 2. And so long as we have 5 out of the 6 terms, we can solve the 6. And that's what we did last time, to calculate what the, the pressure was on a car that was driving in front of a, a jet engine, if you remember. And so we can do that. So the other thing that we could do is if we wanted to go perpendicular to this from point 3 to point 4 oops, let's get rid of this to some other point point 4 then we could also do the same kind of thing and we'll find out that Bernoulli's expression looks like this but we won't just pull it out of a hat we'll actually rationalize how we would get that so let's first uh, figure out how to get this expression here then we'll talk about how to use Bernoulli, what stagnation points mean when velocities go to zero. We've already done one, actually, right? The car running in front of the uh, airplane engine, velocity goes to zero against the car, stagnation point. Stagnation is just a fancy term for velocity going to zero and how that occurs, and I don't think we'll get to these other two. So that's our, our plan. Okay. So Bernoulli, one of our favorite guys dead white males. <laughs> dying, dying breed, of course. Okay. Could also call it Bernoulli as well, I suppose. Okay. So, what's the geometry? Well, the geometry that we're going to use is this, and we've used it before. And this might be. So this is, don't need this, I don't think we need this. So this is this, right? So in the same way that you could have a, a weight on something and you swing it around your head, if you had a bucket on the end of this or a bolus if you're trying to kill cattle or round up cattle in the pampas in Argentina, is that it's spinning around. The reason that it stays down at the end is because of centripetal force. It has an acceleration because the tip, although it's going at the same speed, it's not changing its speed as it goes around my head. It's going at a meter a second. I don't know what the, velocity, what the speed is. But it's changing direction, so it's accelerating. So as a function of accelerating, without trying to take my head off, then we know that if we draw this figure for how this works, then this is its arc. And I'm going to try and draw this. So this is one location here. This is the center of ro rotation. It's rotating at some 
rotational speed, which we'll call omega. It goes through some angle theta, uh, and it has some velocity, which we've called in the past v theta because of this. But this is also equal to our streamlined velocity. All the velocities that we talk about in Bernoulli are streamlined velocities. It's the velocity along the streamline. Clearly, the velocity along the streamline is the maximum, and the velocity perpendicular to it, by definition, must be zero, right? Orthogonal to it. And so it only means something if it's along the streamline. Um, we can write this is equal to a radius which is equal to zero, and this is equal to a different radius which is r. And in terms of these coordinates, this direction here is going to be our r direction. This is going to be, if you like, our theta direction. And importantly, we have a unit normal. So this is an, a right angle here. This unit normal is directed into the rotation center. So that, that's, that's important. So that's our sign convention. It's written backwards, actually, because I think the right-hand rule for rotation says that this is your axis of rotation, and your fingers are the positive direction of rotation, but it doesn't matter about that sign convention for, for now. And so what can we say about this thing? Uh, we can say that the rotational speed, if you like, v theta, is equal to this streamline speed, which is equal to r omega. So whatever radius we are, then it will be equal to this radius multiplied by its rotation speed. Um, from this, we can also write that if we take the square of this, if we just square this, we get this. Right? This is just squaring this component here. And I can't remember this, but uh, if you remember from our uh, statics, uh, minus rho r omega squared dr equals zero. This is our static equation that we developed for uh, the rotating fluids, which we have. And so what we could do is we could uh, no, it's, it's not there. <coughs> take that out. So let's now manipulate this by multiplying both sides by dr. So we end up with dp minus rho r omega squared dr. We can integrate both sides and see what we get. And if we do that, we get what? We get uh, p minus rho integral of r is a half r squared omega squared <coughs> equals constant, I guess, if the integration. If we divide both sides through by unit weight, which is just rho g, get rid of this, get rid of this, and then we should have something which is p over gamma plus, well, I guess we've done the integration, I guess we could leave this, yeah, I guess I didn't want to do that integration. I guess uh, p rho Yeah, I guess I want to go back to this stop here. So I'm going to forget that we did that integration because I want to, to keep it separate. And so I'm going to take the density out. I'm going to divide through by density times g. I'm going to have r omega squared dr and keep that integral and have that equal to constant. And if we do that, then I'm going to uh, 
uh, what am I trying to do? Okay, multiply by R over R. And, ah, yeah, 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 okay. So now we've got pressure divided by unit weight. We can get rid of this. We have 1 over G. We have this term here, which is now this term here, which we can resubstitute as this. So the integral V streamlined squared divided by R and D R. This should be a minus still, right? I'm screwing around with that equals constant. And so almost there, even though I made a pig's, <coughs> pig's breakfast of it. So now if we notice that this term here is a direction which is radially outward, a direction <coughs> radially inward in the opposite direction is minus dr. then we can just rewrite this final expression as this is minus dn. So this becomes a plus, and I'll write it overall as streamlined velocity squared over gravity r dn. I'm going to magically add a z to it equals constant. So, all by way of saying that in the same way that we made the conversion to Bernoulli's <coughs> equation from looking at F equals MA written for a static fluid, here we've done exactly the same for a rotating fluid, accelerating fluid in static form. And the expression comes out for it exactly the same. And so the only important thing here is this final expression is basically Bernoulli's equation written perpendicular to a streamline and that we can use to be able to, to solve e expressions for going perpendicular to a streamline, as you'd expect, okay? So let's have a look at, whoops, sorry. So, so hopefully, well, not hopefully, this is exactly this. And also its differential form. This is its integrated form, and this is its differential form. And this is what we can use to be able to define pressures as you go perpendicular streamline. And so, for instance, uh, you could ask yourself the question as you drive the Jaguar around the, uh, the loop, what is the extra pressure that you'd feel in your, your blood as you sit in the seat because you're being pressed into the seat? Uh, I guess if you go around that way, you'd have an increase in pressure, you could imagine. How much is that increase in pressure? And so those are the kinds of expressions that we'll deal with. So we don't need to do that. 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 But we do this. Okay. So this is basically an exposition of this. So here's the uh, equivalent of our, our ski jump that we saw in, in some of those earlier videos. And so you, have, you could imagine that you're going along this pathway. And all of a sudden, something happens here. So it's not very different from a car going over a, uh, a rise in the road. You'd expect, I think, as you go across here, that you would be pushed into your seat as you rise up here because you're on the inside of a curve. And as you're on the outside of a curve, then you'd be lifted out of your seat and you'd be lighter than, uh, uh, than gravity. You'd, you'd feel less than, less than 1G. It's the same principle as the vomit comet when you go over par parabola when flying, that briefly as you go over this parabola, if you're going fast enough, you're basically weightless and you're floating around on the inside of the, the plane. And so uh, we can use this to be able to say something about uh, the behavior. So this is the expression that we can use, which we've alluded to before. And the idea is that what we'd like to do is these, these are individual streamlines that are going across here. This is one streamline, and this is a second streamline. And so if you wanted to, we could go from location one to two, and this is the radial direction, uh, and we could figure out exactly what the pressures are at these points. And so we've only talked about static fluids so far, 
but the question now is, how does the pressure change as we go from location 2 to location 1? We certainly know what the pressure at location 2 is, right? It's atmospheric, because it's sitting on a free surface. Um, and if we know the velocities on these streamlines, then we have enough information to calculate. So if we wanted to, we could um, write this expression. So this A and B is the, the first portion. Uh, so what do we have here? If we wrote it out Bernoulli's expression for A to B, what would it be? We have to label each of these as locations 1 or locations 2. So let's actually write it out in longhand. I'll, I'll do it over here. So P1 plus rho integral V1 squared over <coughs> radius dn plus <coughs> unit weight times Z1 has to equal P2 plus the same term, which is this centripetal <coughs> acceleration term. plus the elevation term, unit weight times Z2. Can you see it when I write that small? I'm not sure how that comes out. And so what we'd like to know is this. What is P1? And so this is the easiest one, because if we look at this, what's the radius of curvature of this arc? So if we drew the arc here that had some radius, if it's a straight line, an infinite straight line, the radius of that has to be infinity. And so for each one of these, the distance from location 1 to the center of rotation has to be infinity. Buzz Lightyear, right? That's your wrong generation maybe for you. Um, so we, we don't care about the rest of this because this goes to zero. Um, we have an elevation z1 which we measure relative to a datum. So this is positive z, so this is z2 and z1. And so we know what this is. And uh, we know what p2 is. This is atmospheric, which is zero. It has the same radius, right? If you do it, if it's a horizontal line, this is also infinity. <coughs> and this is Z2. So if we write this out, we end up with P1 um, is equal to P2, which is 0. I'm going to move this term onto the left-hand side, which is equal to unit weight multiplied by z2, which is this term here, minus this term here. And so that's actually a familiar term, because this term here, of course, z2 is bigger than z1. This is just equal to whatever this distance is here. And this is h. And so perhaps not unsurprising, we could have guessed this, that, well, that in a static fluid that's just ch channeling along and happy to, to go along, there's no shear in it, then the pressure distribution as we go along from here is just uh, the same as going down in a swimming pool. It's not affected in any way by the fact that we're moving at some, some velocity. And so, and that's a function of the fact that this radius of curvature here is uh, infinitely large, and therefore this centripetal term, this centripetal acceleration term, is infinitely small. It's zero, basically. So that's the first part. The second part is to be able to figure out what the, the behavior is. Can use exactly the same idea here between these two points. So now, if you look at this, and you look at extending these lines here, this magnitude r would be, this would be, I suppose, r4. This would be, I suppose, r3 to these points. If it's large enough, you can take them as being the same. And I think in this example, uh, we might take them as being the same. Um, and we can do the same thing. And so um, 
we can figure out exactly what the, the pressure distribution would be. What do we expect? We said that going over a bump in a car, you will be lifted out of your seat. So maybe we'd expect it to be less than hydrostatic. This is the hydrostatic pressure that we feel here. It goes down at the unit weight times the depth. And so maybe in the same way as if we accelerate something by dropping down out of an elevator, we know that the pressure distribution is less than hydrostatic. So let's see if I can keep everything on here. Um, well, yeah, I'll write it on here as well. So what, what's it going to be? It's going to be, well, I need that expression on the top, I suppose. So let's do it here. So we're going to do it between P3 and P4. Let's do P4 first, because I see that's written out here. So if we do it between, it doesn't matter which way we do it. For Bernoulli, it can be 4 first or 3 first. So it's P4 plus density times the integral streamline velocity squared over R4 uh, dn plus unit weight of water times Z4 has to equal just the same expression but with the index applied that's P3. I guess this would be velocity 4 this would be velocity 4, sorry, 3 and unit weight times C3. So that's the expression. So now we don't have the luxury of the fact that R4 and R3 go to infinity and so these terms are going to exist. If we want to make our life a little easier let's just say that um, R4 is approximately equal to R3. That'll be true if it's a big radius of curvature, right? If you're looking at two points on this, four and three here, and I'm swinging around my head so that the length of the cable is long, but the difference between those points separation is, lot, is small, then um, that's going to be true. And so we can rearrange this to take these two terms. And write them two together. And so that's what you have here. Perhaps I'll, I will write it out. So P4 we still have, which is this. We have is equal to this term here, which is this. P3 we have, which is this. And unit weight times Z3 we have is this. And so what we have left are these two circled terms. And I suppose we could... Uh, write those out as these integrals, if you like, are integrals between what? They're integrals between radius of equal to zero and R4, if you can see that. And this is between a radius of zero or location zero and R3. Okay. And so the other thing we're also going to do, remember that we defined here as a convenience and uh, let's flip to this. We define this convenience that the outer radius direction is equal to the coordinate pointing into the center of radius, dn. dn is what we've used in this expression, which is here. And so the other thing that we could do is that we could convert dn back into dr. But in this particular case, dr, the most convenient one to use, is to use the fact that this direction is dn, but this direction is what? Not dr. It is dr, actually, but it's also dz. And so we can also write in this particular case that a change in the direction towards the center of rotation is equal to a minus change in the z direction, right? Just from this. And so that is exactly what this is here. So this is dn. This is plus dn in this particular case. And if you just write out these expressions and integrate between them, uh, so where am I going to do that? I'm going to write out these two. I'm running out of space. Where am I going to put it? And so if you like the integral 0 to r4, V 
over R dz. So this is this term here. Forget the the, the row. The integral v squared over R R dz. Uh, let's subtract this term <coughs> from both sides minus the integral from 0 to R3 V squared over R dz. What does that equal, right? It's just a limit from 0 to R4 minus the same term. If we assume that the velocities are roughly the same because they're close to each other, if we assume that the rate, because they're close to each other, the radius out to them is the same, then you can take these V4s and V3s and write them together. And what is the, what is this? This is just the integral of the limits between 0 and R4. And this is going to be R3, R4, V squared over R dz. So this term here is basically what's gone in here. This is this, right? Okay. And it's z because r is r and z are exactly the same relative to the, the data. And so we we know that, right? Because well, you know from your math if you take an integral, an integral is just an equation that allows you to calculate the area under some curve, right? And if you take the integral between 0 to r4, then it just means it's this particular area here. If you take the integral between 0 and r3, it's just the integral of this area here. And if you physically subtract them from each other, you're left with this term here. So that's really physically all this is, right, in, in terms of mathematical expression. So, so what are the ramifications of this? If you do that, then you can convert this, these two individual integrals here into this term here. If you gather terms, then you end up with the fact that P3 is equal to, so you were left with the magnitudes of these two terms here, or these two terms here. Just the differences in the height of these two terms here is just the elevation change, so that's this. H, again, is just this height between these two locations. This is H here. I know it's getting kind of messy, but you get the picture. The punchline is pretty straightforward, actually. The punchline is merely this. The punchline is that the pressure at point 3, if I put everything here, is going to be equal to uh, the pressure at point, <coughs> point 4. So this term here is atmospheric. So it's equal to zero. So this would also have, if you like, P4 on here. But this is zero. So the pressure at point three is equal to the pressure at point four plus unit weight times the height above it, which gives you the, the, the swimming pool pressure, if you're sitting at that point, minus some amount. Velocity is always positive. Radius is always, velocity squared has to be positive, right? Radius is positive, density is positive. And this integral between 3 and 4 is going to be positive as well. And so this is a positive number. And so in other words, the pressure that you'd see at this point varies, is less than that. So in other words, if you're going along and looking at points 4 and 3, and you look at pressure changing with depth, this would be the hydrostat. P is equal to minus ZH, I guess, right, as you go down here, or plus ZH. So the reality is that the, what this is saying is that the pressure, because you're going across here, would be less than hydrostatic. That's all. So and we can calculate what that magnitude would be. So the only point is that, I guess, Bernoulli we can write uh, linearly. Uh, we can write it between upstream and downstream points. We can also write it across a streamline. We could write it between points 1 and 3 if we wanted to. We could write it between points 2 and 4 if we wanted to. If we did that, then the appropriate equation for us to use would be these top ones, this one here, either in full form 
or in differential form. If we want to go across a streamline from 3 to 4, then the appropriate one to use is this, which has this centripetal term within it. Uh, and this allows us to be able to calculate how fluid pressures would change as you go across the streamline. And importantly, I think, uh, both of these expressions are derived from F equals MA or F equals MAC. This is centripetal acceleration. This is a, an important expression for you to remember maybe the next few days. Okay. Even though we're talking about uh, fluid dynamics, that also turns up in fluid statics, right? Accelerating fluids as statics. And so, so the outcome is pretty straightforward. So what would uh, you predict then that the pressure would be at this point as you go across in this direction? It's getting a really messy figure, but I guess uh, you could imagine that if you look at this behavior here, that if you're going along a trajectory that does this, which is what we've just really done, and if you have a streamline that goes on top of this, which does this as well, so these are whatever ride that you're going on at the at Sandusky point. Then if you look at the point here, then this now is R. This is the center of rotation. This is a streamline velocity. This is, if you like, points, uh, what did we call it? It was uh, 2, 1, 3, 4. So this would be 5, 6, I guess, just by. Again, the magnitude of the inward radius would be equal to n. Uh, I should have aligned this a bit better, I guess. I could have done it through this point here, just as you start to take off, right? So let's call this uh, 7 and 8. All I want to show is the fact that this value of n that points into the center of rotation is also, in this case, equal to the direction of z. So in this particular case, dn is equal to positive dz. This has to point into the center of rotation, n by definition. This has to point in the vertical direction. And I guess let's do it on this one as well. So this is n here. Let's call this n1 and z1. And let's call this n2 and z2. So dn2 is equal to minus dz and so the ramifications of this, if we write out this expression, P over unit weight plus V squared over R G integral <coughs> dN plus Z equals constant. All I'm trying to make the point is that because of this transformation here, this is the one we just did ad nauseum. <coughs> to represent this behavior where you're going over a hill, it turns this into a negative, and therefore it ends up being p over gamma minus this integral, plus z equals constant. And that represents this location here. If we draw it at this location, what's going to happen? It's going to be p over gamma. It's going to be minus the integral v squared over r g again dn whoops sorry and because in this particular case dz equals positive dn right this because these n is aligned exactly with the direction upwards then this is going to be a positive. 
And so by the same token that when you go over the bump, you feel that it's less than hydrostatic. When you go into it on the ski jump, on the ramp into it, because you're going around a different curvature <coughs> instead of this curvature, then you feel the opposite effect. You get pressed into it. And so if you imagine that if you look at the pressure distribution with depth relative to the free surface in each one of these two cases, then this would be the hydrostat. This is pressure. This is, I guess, minus Z. This is pressure equals H unit weight. Then we know that as we go on this trajectory, it would be less than this. And we know that if we go on oh, the opposite, uh, opposite, right? As we go on this trajectory, it would be less than hydrostatic. And we know as, as if we go on this trajectory, it would be greater than hydrostatic. That's what we're saying. So the sign of this changes because of this. And so, so I guess it's important in doing these problems to realize this difference between the z direction and the n direction to be able to do that. It's, it's all locked up in there. Yes, sir? There'd be a, uh, I think it has to be neutral in the middle, right? Yeah. yeah. So it has to go through that. I think it's not so easy to calculate that uh, exact, well, you could, you could integrate it. But these integrals are obviously trivial because they're of our assumptions, right? Yeah. But it would, it has to change, right? It has to rotate as you go. It has to rotate. Well, it has to go first from, it has to rotate from this way up to here as you go from here to here. And then once you're in this point here, it has to go back from there through neutral to this point, And then it has to come back. Yeah, so yeah, good point. OK. Wasn't it worthwhile getting up this morning? OK. OK, so. So, well, we've probably done that to death now looking at, uh, at that. And so there's some longhand versions of this that I think explain the same thing. But it's important to, to deal with this. Uh, so these are the so we're never going to ask you to derive these expressions. I just do that for fun here, uh, but it's important to realize they where they come from. They do come from F equals ma. Centripetal and just linear acceleration. I guess this is linear acceleration. So these are the expressions you use. I never write them like this. I always write them in terms of unit weights, uh, just because I remember them as a length and it makes it just easier and so that's just my proclivity for doing that I guess uh, they look similar in fact they're identical of course aren't they except for this term in the middle and they're different by this term in the middle because in one point you have uh, a linear acceleration which is this term here and the other case you have a centripetal acceleration which is this term here but otherwise they're they're the same okay what else? Um, we talked about the meanings of these things. I said we talked about stagnation. Uh, we kind of talked about stagnation before, but we never gave it an official term. Stagnation is a, a, just a fancy way, sometimes uh, called saltation uh, velocity. Bless you. And it's the idea that if you have a streamline that's going along, it's going along happily, it has some velocity as it goes downstream. If you have one that impacts an object, then all of a sudden it has to physically basically split and go around this object then physically at this point it's going at zero velocity so it's happily going along hits you in the chest and of course if you're walking into the wind and it hits you into the chest basically it transfers the momentum that's carried in that wind so it's it's decelerating in space against your chest which is why we do this conversion for you remember f equals ma which is equal to mass times dv dt, which we can write as dv dt dx. This is a, an acceleration in space, and this term is just a velocity, right? How far you go in a given time. So we can always write an acceleration as a velocity 
times a change in velocity in space instead of a change in velocity with time. And this term here is just the v squared over 2g term. So this is exactly what, what this is. And so when you go from a big velocity to zero velocity, you're destroying that velocity. It's exchanging the momentum that the wind has some place away from you into you as a force, and it pushes you over. And so that's physically what's going on. And so the fancy way of referring to that is a stagnation point where the velocity goes to zero, where it hits you in the chest and transfers the, the momentum to the car, which rolls down the runway behind the, uh, the jet. Um, and so those kinds of behaviors are epitomized in some of the examples that you can do. Um, I think you perhaps understand how to, to do these now. We have five minutes left. I should ask if there are any questions, and um, otherwise we just roll into doing this for five minutes. No? Okay. So a loon dives into water. And so what's going on? Um, yeah, okay. So flying in the air, so what's the transformation that we want to use? Well, we could think of this, we know it has to be steady state, right? And clearly, if you see a bird flying through the wind at steady state, it's not satisfying that requirement because it's physically moving. So we could transfer it into steady state that instead of having the loon flying and the water static, we could have the loon static and the water flowing past it. And that's typically what we do. And so imagine if that's the case that this is going at some velocity here, v1. At this point here, it's going at v2, which is equal to zero. And then if we write Bernoulli's expressions for these as p1 and p2, we're asked what is the dynamic pressure that develops against it if it's flying in the air versus flying in, swimming in water, I guess, diving in water. And so we write Bernoulli's expression for that. P1 over gamma plus V1 squared over 2G plus Z1 is equal to P2 over gamma plus velocity head V squared 2 over 2G plus z2. We make life easy for ourselves by assuming that the loon flies in the same elevation, roughly true, in which case this and this cancel out. We do calculations relative to gauge pressure. So this pressure here is equal to zero, but this velocity is not equal to zero. We've said that V2 has to equal to zero, so this term has to be zero. And then we're just left with P2 over unit weight is equal to V1 squared over 2G. We know what the velocities are of these. Um, if it's, uh, the, they're the same velocities in each case. And so I guess we'd end up with, um, what do we want? We just end up with P2 is equal to rho g v1 squared over 2g. Get rid of the g's. Rho v squared over 2. And so if we know what the velocity is and we know what the differences in the densities are of the two systems, we know that water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. We know that air is a thousandth of that, about 1 kilogram per cubic meter we could calculate what the, uh, the velocities are that give us the different pressures. Nothing more than that. So you have six variables. You need to know five of them. If you know five of them, you can solve for the, the remaining one. Nothing more than that. 